seven years old when Sally Ride blasted into space. I just gave away my age for those that can do math. I understood it was a big moment, and I'm sure if you had quizzed me, I would have been able to tell you that she was the first female astronaut. But to be honest with you, uh, just what that meant in our society was truly lost on my naive seven-year-old self. And I have to confess that that sort of level of naivety actually followed me well into my 20s. You see, as a PhD student in psychology and neuroscience, I truly didn't appreciate that women were underrepresented in the sciences. I mean, sure, I knew women were less likely to study physics and engineering, but I thought that was purely choice-driven. I had no concept that there were certain barriers that existed that drove women out of these particular fields, even if it was something they were passionate about and something they were really good about. And I call this my naive phase. Well, about eight years ago, it lasted a long time, uh, about eight years ago, I found myself at what is probably the largest scientific uh, conference in my field. And one of my colleagues said to me, um, would you like to go to the woman in science meeting? I thought to myself, why is there a need to talk about women in science at a psychology conference? But anyway, but I went along with a sure, you know, curiosity. What could we possibly talk about at this meeting? Well, I sat and I listened to woman after woman stand up and talk about the challenges they faced as scientists, as psychologists. And they faced these challenges because they were women, not because of the particular discipline they were in. I heard women talk about how uh, it took so much longer to get tenure, and I heard one uh, woman stand up who was in her mid-30s and say, they told me not to have children until I have tenure. How can I possibly wait that long? Biology won't remain on my side for much longer. Suffice it to, suffice it to say, I left the room thinking to myself, what on earth have I gotten myself into? Is this my reality? I spent a lot of time that day trying to rationalize all of this, and I came up actually with what I truly believed at the time was a good explanation. This is an American problem. <laughs> I decided to blame our neighbors to the south because, you see, I, I had some sense that family leave policies, maternity leave policies, were much more advanced in Canada. They remain so today. And so I truly convinced myself by the end of the day that not only were we superior at hockey folks, <laughs> we were superior at how we treat women in science. Sort of the denial phase, ignorant phase, call it what you will. However, I'll cut to the chase and tell you that this conversation kept coming up as I sat around tables, how difficult it was and I was calculating. These were women at Canadian institutions. These were, these were women working in science fields in can Canadian industry. So I had to accept that this was my chosen career path or get out, like a lot of women did. I decided to accept it, but acceptance does not equal tolerance. No. I, used to, I was a redhead as a child, and I developed quite a sense of anger about the whole thing, to be honest with you. And I decided, just in the last several years, as I sort of grew into my own comfort uh, with this topic, that I was going to transform my anger into energy and passion and try to educate people about the barriers that exist for women in science. And I knew I wasn't going to change society in general, but maybe I could impact my students, maybe I could impact my institution. Now, just to reflect back a little bit on history, I, I feel the need to tell you that in the 1960s, the discrimination against women scientists was blatant. In fact, it was not uncommon for job ads for scientists, whether in industry or academia, to have the proviso, women need not apply. Vivian Gornick, in her book, The History of Women in Science, talks about this renowned geneticist. She actually doesn't give her name. But this renowned geneticist, uh, when she was a, a graduate student at an Ivy League school, 
Uh, her, she was actually segregated from her male colleagues. Females were one class and the males were in the class across the hall. The male professor came in and he told the women on their first day, you're here to do two things. Number one, to become a research associate. In other words, you're never going to have your own lab. And number two, you're here to very likely marry one of the male scientists across the hall. It's unbelievable, isn't it? But you know, not all women before the 1960s, not all women afterwards listened to the advice. Of course, some of you might recognize uh, Dr. Herman from Acadia, the biologist, is shaking his head. We have Barbara McClintock, Dr. Barbara McClintock, who, of course, uh, was the lone recipient of the Nobel Prize in 1983 for her work on genetic transposition. The middle figure may not be as familiar to some of you, but this is Dr. Uh, Vina Rowett, and she was the first woman to receive her PhD in electrical engineering from Queen's University in the early 70s. And she went on to become an absolute giant in the field of telecommunications in Canada. And, and, and she's actually on lists of the most powerful uh, women uh, and, and persons, actually, in Canada. And, of course, my favorite example, the woman who blasted the space ceiling. Forget about the glass ceiling. <laughs> Dr. Sally Ride, who had a PhD in astrophysicist and went on to a successful career afterwards. We have a Nobel laureate. We have a woman in space. We have a woman in charge of industry. But the problem is not fixed. Here's a snapshot. It's, this data is from Statistics Canada. And it shows the percentage of females enrolled in various disciplines by their degree in 2008, 2009. And what you see is that there is this trend for women to, uh, to less and less go from the bachelor's to the master's to the doctoral degree. And no more uh, is this, is the, are females underrepresented in science careers than in disciplines like engineering and computer science. If I showed you life beyond the doctoral degree, it just gets more depressing. It no longer looks like the leaky pipeline. It's gushing. Okay? We have very few women in these roles. So why does the pipeline start to leak? And how do we stop it? A lot of people really point to the cultural messaging that children receive right from birth. Girls, we fixate on how pretty and beautiful they are. And boys, we tell them they're big, strong boys before they can even keep their heads steady. <laughs> Go into your favorite store. Everything for girls is pink. Everything for boys is blue. Girls are destined to become princesses. And boys are destined to become construction workers or superheroes. I realize these sound like very harmless messages. I'm guilty. I have a four-year-old daughter, and I can tell you she wants nothing more in life than to meet Cinderella and Belle and Ariel. <laughs> OK? I, I failed, Dana. I failed. <laughs> but, but these harmless messages that we, we give children at such a young age become ingrained in them. It forms false stereotypes about what a girl is, what a girl can do, what a girl can't do. And the same is true for boys. I've just chosen to focus on the danger of these false stereotypes for girls today. I could easily stand here and give a talk about boys. We do the same thing. For girls, these messages ended up translating into this notion that I can't do math and I can't do science. And let's face it, what is attractive about a scientist? This is what girls think. And in fact, would you believe the stereotype that exists that girls can't do math? Well, they have a t-shirt for it. <laughs> These aren't sold in the mall booth. These are sold by huge retailers, J.C. Penney, David, and Goliath. There's one for little girls that says, I'm too cute to do my homework, so I get my brother to do it for me. I pride myself on keeping my frontal lobes intact. I hope they stay with me well into my 80s. But if a, a female student walked into my classroom wearing one of these t-shirts, my frontal lobes would fail, and I wouldn't need scotch for that to happen. <laughs> I can tell you that if I had a dollar for every time a young woman approached me. I, I teach a statistics class at Acadia. It's really hardly math for any mathematicians. I know, it's not really math. But the young women will tell me, Dr. Newman, I can't do math. 
I would be enjoying Freedom 45 if I had a dollar for every time I've heard that. What is the truth? Can girls do math? The reality is, as people have analyzed the data, international data sets, there was just a publication in the Proceedings, the National Academy of the Sciences, PNAS, this is a huge journal, okay? And what they showed is that in countries where there tends to be more gender equality, the gender gap in math performance has practically closed completely, especially amongst the average performers. If you go amongst those uh, people who do math above that 99th percentile, what you find is that within certain ethnic cultures uh, living in the United States, the gender gap there has completely closed to girls can do math. It is cultural. It is not innate. Unfortunately, girls experience a great deal of anxiety and apprehension about confirming a negative stereotype about their social group. In this case, that girls can't do math. So even when girls have this passion for math and they're enrolled in their math class, they're very concerned about performing poorly. So much so that when marks are given back and they see that they haven't done well, they assume that all their male colleagues have done terrific on this math test. They are the only ones that are bringing down the class average. And of course, that's not true. Develops into something called stereotype threat. But what I, what I want to tell you is that you can remove the angst and the anxiety. You can remove the stereotype threat that they experience simply by telling, and these, this study was actually based on university students writing a calculus test. If you tell them, this test produces no gender differences, and I think that's uh, over on your left, then there's actually no difference in the performance on those tests. Girls will actually do better if you tell them there's no gender differences. It's very much a thumbprint on their mind, and it's a dangerous one that affects their performance. So we need to be cognizant of that as educators, whether we're talking about elementary, junior high, high school, or certainly within universities of this fact. There's also something called implicit gender bias, the explicit bias, that blatant discrimination doesn't ex exist very much anymore, but there's something called the implicit gender bias. It's something that get, gets buried into our unconscious self and that we can't seem to get rid of it even if we want to. This is one of the best examples of it. Here you had male and female scientists were given resumes of male and female students applying to work. Uh, in their labs. The resumes were actually identical. The only thing they changed was whether it was a female name or a male name. And what you see behind uh, me here is that the males were rated more highly on competence, higher ability, and they were rated as deserving of more mentorship for future careers as scientists than the females were. But what was most disturbing to me, what was most disturbing to the authors of the study, was that the female scientists were every bit as likely to, uh, to rate the females as less competent, horrible, and deserving of mentorship as the male scientists. This demonstrates a dangerous implicit bias. Advancing women in science is only going to happen until we find ways to reduce and eliminate the implicit gender bias that exists. We can do this simply by being aware of it. You can take the implicit association test online. It's a Harvard website that will allow you to do that. Find out about your own implicit bias. Be aware of it. Institutions can have very rigorous evaluation criteria for addressing scholarships, applications for faculty members. Industry and workplaces can have the same sort of thing. And it has been shown that we can reduce and possibly eliminate this biases. The other barrier that exists is the image of the scientist that gets portrayed in the recruitment posters and the one that gets portrayed in the media. We have this image of a scientist as the lone, solitary man sitting in the lab or in front of his computer late at night, void of all human contact. <laughs> okay, think Sheldon Cooper. And working on a problem that really only he cares about. You see, this is completely incompatible 
with a woman's desire to help others. This is the one aspect, actually, that may be truly biological and innate in nature, is that women seem to have a desire to work in careers that serve communal goals. Women want to help others. Want, women want human contact. Women want to serve the greater good. Why do we have to continue to portray these myths of what scientists do? Scientists do help others. Science is collaborative. Engineers work in developing nations to improve infrastructure, to improve the quality of drinking water. My colleague at Acadia, Jennifer Rand, does that. Physicists, there's probably no one more important in the development of diagnostic imaging than physics, physicists. And we need to ensure that when we're teaching our classes, when we're developing our recruitment posters, that we're sensitive to these communal goals that women have. But the number one barrier that exists for women in science relates to the elephant in the room. <laughs> and that is women as young as 15 believe, 15, believe that science and motherhood don't mix. I could stand and talk for hours. I could show you data that would actually seem to confirm this fact that it's very difficult to become a tenured scientist, to get promoted, blah, 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 blah. I have a four-year-old. I had my four-year-old before I had tenure. I was told, by the way, by female colleagues, don't have a child before you have tenure. I didn't listen. See, Mom? You don't always need to listen. <laughs> so the reality is, is there are women who do this. Athena Donald, a renowned physicist at Cambridge University when she was elected as a fellow to the Royal Society, she remarked on how the only person they actually interviewed, there was four other women at that time, the only other woman they interviewed for this said, I couldn't be a successful scientist and be a mother. And Athena Donald just, she just, just went, oh, why did they have to interview her? I have children, I'm successful. Two of the other women have children and I'm successful. Males aren't the one putting these ideas in young scientists' minds, it is the female scientists themselves that are putting this, that you can't be successful. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot that universities can do. There's a lot that the workplace can do. Number one, provide high quality daycare. Simple. That's the number one thing that can be done for female scientists is to provide high quality daycare. And to have policies that are family friendly. And I won't take my time to talk about those policies, but they're all very, very critical. But we should never have a situation where a woman has to choose between having a child and having a career. 50 years later, we've almost come full circle. It's to the point now where scientists' ads might as well say in flashing lights, women, please apply. Why? Because men aren't going into careers in science as much anymore either. They're opting for skilled trades. So what's happening is ec economists in Canada and the US are predicting a critical shortage of skilled scientists. Look, my talk isn't about making all women be scientists. It's about ensuring that if they have a passion and a talent for science, that they don't feel that their gender is a barrier to it. And I hope all of you feel just a little bit more enlightened about this and that you will go back to your own institutions and think about ways to address these barriers. Thank you.